And uh, we're going to go ahead this morning and continue in John's Gospel. So if you have your Bible, and I really hope you do, we're going to go ahead and invite you to open to John's Gospel, chapter 11. And if you've been following or if you've been with us, uh, you know that last time we uh, we saw how Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. He had uh, Jesus had gotten word that Lazarus, the one whom he loved, was sick. Jesus loved Lazarus and his sisters, Mary and Martha, who uh, figure prominently in the Gospel of John. And uh, word came to uh, Jesus that Lazarus was sick. And so, uh, strangely, when he got word about this, he didn't immediately go to him to heal him, as no doubt Mary and Martha had been hoping. And as we see that uh, they had kind of complained to him about it, sort of in a grieving sort of a way. Uh, why weren't you here, essentially? You know, our brother would not have died had you come. Well, Jesus didn't come on purpose in order that he might come later uh, after Lazarus had died. Matter of fact, without getting any word from anybody, so far as we can tell, before Jesus goes or as he's about to go with his disciples there, he says, Lazarus is sleeping. Well, what Jesus meant by that, as he goes on to explain, is not that he's sleeping, getting better, like the fever had broken, but rather he has died. And that euphemism of sleep is something that goes on to characterize uh, the death of believers. We see this often in the New Testament. Well, Jesus goes there, and by the time he gets there with the disciples, Lazarus has been dead four days. He's been in the grave. And so um, as he... Uh, weeps along with the mourners, those who are grieving the loss. Of course, the Lord is not grieving in the same way because he knows he's going to ultimately bring Lazarus back from the dead. But we wonder if maybe the reason he's weeping alongside of them is first to, to, uh, to, to share in their sorrows as, as our shepherd, as our savior. He, he understands our sorrows and our sufferings. But also because it, it sort of is a picture in that setting of the cost of sin, the separation it causes. And, uh, and maybe that's an insight of window into the heart of God as we see him weeping there uh, over the consequences of sin. But of course, that is why he came into the world to ultimately defeat uh, both death, the enemy, the grave, uh, Satan himself, ultimately uh, through his own death and resurrection, which we'll come to in the coming weeks as we continue through the gospel. So having raised uh, Lazarus from the dead, he called him forth from the tomb. Lazarus comes out still bound in the grave clothes. They loose him and let him go. And the next time we'll see them uh, is uh, is a few days hence, uh, as uh, Jesus will um, go to be with them in Bethany uh, and share a meal with them. And we'll talk about that the next time we're in the Gospel of John. But this morning we're going to pick it up right after Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. And in particular, we find ourselves looking here at chapter 11, starting in verse 45, where John records, Then many of the people who had come with Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and reported to them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees called the council together and said, What are we doing? For this man is performing many miraculous signs. And if we allow him to go on this way, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away our place or our sanctuary, as some versions will translate it, will take away our place and our nation. And then one of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said, You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is more to your advantage to have one man die for the people than for the whole nation to perish. Now, he did not say this on his own, but because he was high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the Jewish nation, and not for the Jewish nation only, but to gather together into one the children of God who are scattered. And so from that day, they planned together to kill him. Thus Jesus no longer went around publicly among the Judeans, but went away from there to the region near the wilderness, to a town called Ephraim, and stayed there with his disciples. Now the Jewish feast of Passover was near, and many people went up to Jerusalem from the rural areas before the Passover to cleanse themselves ritually. Thus they were looking for Jesus and saying to one another as they stood in the temple courts, What do you think, that he won't come to the feast? And now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that anyone who knew where Jesus was should report it so that they could arrest him. Well, as we can tell, there were varying responses to the miracle that Jesus had done. Those who were there and witnessed it, they saw and, uh, and believed for what they had seen. But there were those who had gone from that place to tell the Pharisees what Jesus had done. Uh, and the contrast that John appears to be drawing there, that there are some that believed, some did not, and went there essentially to rat on him, uh, that the Pharisees might come and arrest him. And so... Um, Jesus 
both in his words and his deeds, will always elicit different responses here. Here we see them in very dramatic fashion, not just belief and unbelief, but belief and then a going to ultimately try to stop him and turn him in that he might be silenced. Uh, we see that in various forms today as well, but it's nothing new. Jesus always elicits such a thing. Uh, he came certainly to save the world, to come and die for the sins of man and such, but he also came ultimately to bring division, and that division ultimately finds its expression between those who believe and those who don't. Those who believe hopefully then grow, go on to grow or grow on, then to uh, ultimately deepen their relationship with him, but oftentimes, as is the case with many, uh, those who don't believe only firm up themselves against him further and go and try to find any opportunity to silence him. But thankfully, many did believe. However, we do find the passage focusing now on what happens among those who don't. And so some went to go tell the Pharisees what happened. And as it goes on to say, as they reported what Jesus had done, the chief priests and the Pharisees called a council together. Now, this is speaking of the Sanhedrin, which is uh, the governing body over Israel at the time. And there were parties within the Sanhedrin, and it's helpful to understand this as we put this into a historical context. Uh, there are the Pharisees, which we tend to be uh, extremely well acquainted with by just their virtue of their constant um, antagonistic encounters with the Lord. The Sadducees we see as well, too, although it seems like we, we tend to be more familiar with the Pharisees. The Sadducees are uh, the majority party in the Sanhedrin. The, the Pharisees are a powerful minority, but they are the minority in the Sanhedrin. Uh, the majority in the Sanhedrin uh, belongs to the Sadducees. Um, if you know anything about it, maybe you've heard this sort of cute little expression of the difference between the Pharisees and Sadducees. The Pharisees believed in the supernatural. They believed in the resurrection and all of these ideas there that, that come out of the scriptures. However, uh, the Sadducees did not believe in such things, and so therefore they were sad, you see. Every Sunday school kid in the world knows that, hopefully. But uh, that's one way to define the difference between the two groups. There are other differences. Significantly, um, the Sadducees tended to be the wealthier among the priest class. They were the aristocrats of the time. They were those who were politically minded and therefore were very pragmatic. Or they, were, uh, they weren't so much spiritually minded so much as they were minded about things in regard to the nation and how it fared politically. Uh, maintaining its influence or maintaining its self-governance. Uh, they were much more tied in with what was going on politically with Rome than the Pharisees were. As a matter of fact, Caiaphas, who's mentioned here, uh, is a high priest that year and, and actually was high priest for about 18 years, uh, a very long time for a high priest, but he was uh, installed by Rome uh, in part because he was a favorable person to put in that position. And so they deposed Annas, who was Caiaphas' father-in-law, who we also see in the in the Gospels, uh, and is also referred to as a high priest. But during that time, the actual legitimate high priest as recognized by Rome was, in fact, Caiaphas, or Joseph Caiaphas, or Caiaphas Joseph, however you would uh, articulate that name. But this is one who stands in leadership over the Sanhedrin. Now, it's unclear whether this was an official meeting of the Sanhedrin or whether it was a quickly put together kind of informal gathering. There are some hints that it may have been more of an informal gathering, but nonetheless, they gathered together to discuss what to do about Jesus. And so, significantly, before we move on, let's stop for a moment and recognize what's happening here. Throughout the gospel ministry of Jesus, uh, there are times when the people are so amazed at what he is saying and what he's doing that they actually try to thrust him into that role of delivering Messiah. And they, you know, there are times when they are completely put off by him. And there are other times when they want to just rally together and sort of force him into the role of Messiah. Now, he is the Messiah. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, really only about a week from this point, not long after this at all, uh, he will triumphantly enter Jerusalem and announce himself, present himself as the Messiah, as foretold in the Old Testament scriptures. Um, however, A... That was a very specific timetable that that was going to take place on. Uh, we'll come to that in a moment. B, he was also not the kind of Messiah that the people were uh, expecting him to be. And so therefore, he wasn't going to be thrust into a role that was not what he ultimately came to fulfill in his first coming. 
uh, that ultimately in his first coming, he came to die for the sins of man, not to come and deliver Israel from Roman oppression or to set up his kingdom in Jerusalem right then, but to come first and deal with the ultimate enemy, and that is sin and death, and ultimately the enemy, the devil's grip on mankind through that. Uh, He came to defeat that, to throw it down, to ultimately overrule it, overcome it. And so that was the first coming. However, people were wanting to thrust him into that role of Messiah, but he would not allow it. He would not permit it. And oftentimes, in in connection with that activity of the people to try and push him into that role, we would see this expression that his time had not yet come. And so what that means is, is again, he was working on a very specific timetable. There were certain things he was going to accomplish. There were certain things he was going to teach, he was going to do. But in particular, there was a very specific time of year that he was moving toward. And that is the Passover time. You see, the death of Christ ultimately coincides with the Passover. The Passover is that time where the lamb was presented to the priest, going back to the Exodus. uh, Maybe I'll just explain it that way. In the Exodus, when, when Israel was in Egypt and they had become ultimately enslaved by the Egyptians, God had come through Moses to deliver them. Uh, from that oppression and from that slavery, from that bondage. Well, on the night before they were ultimately not just released, but pushed out by the Egyptians, there was the last plague of the 10 that God brought down, which, by the way, were not random plagues. When you look at those uh, particular assaults of of the Lord on Egypt, they were actually assaults on the very specific, uh, numerous, very specific gods of the Egyptians. They weren't random. They weren't vague. God didn't just sort of pick 10 plagues out of a hat. These, were, these plagues represented certain elements of the gods that the Egyptians worshipped, and God was demonstrating to them that he was greater than all of them. He was sending a message both to his people to give them confidence in their God, but also a message to the Egyptians that the God of the Hebrews was in fact the true God who was capable of putting down their gods at will. And so, <clears throat> that being said, on this final night, the Passover night, um, the, God commanded his people uh, to, to take a lamb and to, uh, to, to slay it and to take the blood from that animal and to put it into a basin and get a hyssop branch. And they were to dip the blood from that hyssop branch and they were to smite the doorposts and the lentils of their homes. Uh, and they were supposed to uh, do this. And, and, and when they did this, when, if you were walking down the street and you saw the, the homes or the abodes of the Jews there in, in Egypt, you would see blood over the doors of their homes. And if you didn't know what was going on, this obviously would seem to be a very odd thing. Well, that night, God would send the angel through the through the Egyptian uh, towns, and ultimately there he would slay the firstborn of every man and animal, uh, of every firstborn uh, son in, in, in Egypt, and, and every firstborn animal in Egypt. And so uh, there was tremendous weeping and wailing that night, and God... Uh, gave them a great deliverance and they even plundered the Egyptians as the Egyptians weighed them down with all the gold that they could just throw on them and just told them to get out. Well, that deliverance, that Passover night, was not just about the deliverance of Israel in that time. It ultimately painted a picture that would uh, be ultimately fulfilled in the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. And it's significant in that context, understanding these ideas, that when John the uh, Baptist sees him, he calls out and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's a very specific statement to make. That's not just sort of a you know, random thing to say. No, he was pointing to something prophetically there. The person of of Christ had come, the Lamb of God, God's Lamb, who ultimately had come to take away the sin of the world. Well, that Passover time was the time that Jesus was targeting, ultimately, uh, that he would be crucified. That was the day, in other other words, to make the picture complete. Another uh, element that they could look at and recognize how God was fulfilling what he had promised so many years earlier in the scriptures. Well, that deliverance from bondage was coming, but it was going to come on God's timetable. His time had not yet come. But notice what Jesus has now done. Um, There are other things Jesus will do and say between this point and his entrance into Jerusalem. But John uses this particular miracle uh, as as the culmination of his testimony of the gospel prior to the cross. 
Uh, I think in the synoptics we see Jesus healing lepers, and there are other things he'll say and do between this point and where John chooses to pick it up uh, as he continues his narrative. Uh, but in John's, because again, he's very specific about what he's including because he is driving people toward uh, a recognition of who Jesus is. And so he chooses this as the last miracle prior to the cross that he would record. And this particular miracle is very significant because it deals with a resurrection, with the fact that Jesus has the power over life and death, not just in general, but since he demonstrates his capacity to have power over life and death in himself, as he says, no one, uh, he, as he would say, he also, in regard to his own life, his own giving of his life and his own taking it up again, he has that power in and of himself. Now, we do see the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit all being given credit and, and activity in the resurrection of Christ. But Jesus does not hesitate to say that he has this power in himself. In other words, he is just as responsible uh, for his own resurrection as well as the own laying down, his own laying down of his own life. And so this is the miracle that John records here and a miracle that Jesus did, which was really kind of the crescendo of all of his miracles in terms of his capacity that regardless of how long Lazarus had been dead, it made no difference whatsoever to the Son of God who had the power to bring life back uh, into, uh, into someone who had died. And so this was a tremendous testimony. And when those who saw it believed, uh, this would no doubt make it easier when they found out Jesus was alive after the crucifixion. They could put these things together and recognize now the things that he had said and how they fit into the overall picture that he was painting in his ministry. On the other side of that coin, the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sanhedrin, the chief priests and such, uh, they, they found out about this event and they didn't dispute whether the miracle had happened. However, they pushed against it. They stood against it, and instead of embracing him, they instead rejected him. And they rejected him for any number of reasons, not the least of which is that he was dangerous to them, not only personally and their own authority, but ultimately he was dangerous to Roman rule as well, because he wasn't shaping up to be the Messiah that they thought he was going to be. He wasn't coming as a military leader. He was different. And if he wasn't coming as a military leader and the people were raising him up as their Messiah or their king, then this is very likely the explanation as to, uh, it, it seems very clear this is the explanation that connects best with their ultimate concern and fear regarding him, which we see back in chapter 11 uh, in verse um, in verse 48. Uh, notice again, he's been performing many miraculous signs, and they go on to say that if, he, if we allow him, in verse 48, to go on this way, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away our place and our nation. Um, the, the Jews lived under constant threat of this for a couple of reasons. First off, they were, they were prone to uprising and, and stirring up unrest. Now, the Romans, by and large, did not take this very seriously. As a matter of fact, it's probably helpful for us, again, for the sake of getting a historical context about this. It's helpful for us to understand the setting in which we find ourselves at this time. Uh, Judea, or Israel, the area of Israel, by and large, uh, was really, from a Roman standpoint, Obviously, this is different than our perspective from a biblical standpoint. From, from, from the Roman historical standpoint, uh, this area that we're talking about here in Jesus' time was an extremely irritating, and if it weren't for irritating, it would be a completely insignificant part of the Roman Empire. Uh, they had conquered uh, Jerusalem, and they had taken uh, the Jews essentially as sort of a... Um, as sort of uh, having conquered them in the intertestamental period. Uh, they now ruled over Judea, but they were just as a small province in the overall Roman Empire. And one of the, uh, one of the evidences of that is the fact that the Roman emperors and, and the leadership under the emperors would typically assign low-level managers to, to oversee it. Pontius Pilate, for example, uh, when he's procurator over that area, we don't see lots in history about Pontius Pilate. We 
have found evidence of his existence and of the seat he would rule from, but by and large you don't hear a lot about him because he wasn't very important. And he wasn't very important, uh, the evidence that he wasn't very important is because of the assignment he was given. Just go manage that irritating group over there in the region of Judea. And uh, because it was this way, typically it was where basically Roman leaders went to die, or it was the kind of place where anybody with any aspirations as a Roman leader would try to do well so that he could ultimately climb out of this place. This was not the kind of place that anybody sought after as a position uh, uh, to, to lead in. However, uh, it, uh, the fact is that a couple of very significant people during that time, uh, in the years to come, I should say, but not too far in the distant future, a couple of very significant Romans ultimately played a very significant part in that area. Uh, a number of Roman emperors of the time are well known, um, but one of those who uh, is of interest to us in particular regarding the, this period of time in biblical history uh, came about or was born in about 9 AD, and this was a man named Vespasian. Vespasian was uh, not born of, of you know any particularly great lineage or anything like this. However, he did prove himself worthy as a general. Uh, he was ultimately responsible for conquering some of southern Britain, I believe it was southern Britain, uh, back in the uh, uh, 40s to 60s. AD, and ultimately uh, he was uh, put in charge of this area of Judea. And during that time, he basically bided his time and just made sure that he kept things in, in some relative order during that time uh, until the season, which is known in Roman history as the year of the four emperors, uh, where Tiberius Caesar is, is succeeded during the time of Christ by a number of emperors. However, there are four in this one particular year. I think it was 68 AD. And Vespasian, who has been basically just as trying to establish himself as somebody who can bring order to Rome, which had fallen or into the Roman Empire, which had fallen into some disregard, or, uh, not disregard, but had fallen into uh, sort of disarray in some respects. Uh, three governors or three emperors, I should say, prior to him, one uh, died, the other uh, one committed suicide, and one was assassinated and his body thrown into the Tiber. Uh, and ultimately now there was a gap. Well, Vespasian set himself up through both intrigue and military might, ultimately set himself up as the new emperor. And so he becomes the emperor of Rome. However, by and large, he's unproven with such responsibility. And so a, an uprising uh, arises under Caligula in the 40s, uh, uh, the one of the previous emperors. And so Israel continues to stay, the Jews continue to stay sort of in this place of, of uprisings and pushing back against the Romans and such. Well, this becomes Vespasian's opportunity to establish himself later in the 60s uh, as an uprising occurs in, uh, in, in the late 60s. And uh, Vespasian sends his son, Titus Vespasian, into the area to watch over this and keep the uprisings down. However, in order to establish his father as, as, a, as a solid emperor, and with the understanding that he as the firstborn son would be the one to succeed uh, uh, his father Vespasian once Vespasian died, uh, he decided to take things a little harder, and he ultimately came against Jerusalem and destroyed the city and destroyed the temple, fulfilling what Jesus said about it when the temple was ultimately destroyed, leaving not one stone upon another as as he set fire to it and as the gold from the temple began to seep in between the cracks in the stones his soldiers began to push all the stones off one another in order to scrape all the gold out and they brought the menorah they brought the gold from the temple they brought everything they could get out of there back into uh, back into into Rome uh, ultimately in this great big sir, pomp and circumstance kind of a parade to demonstrate uh, a tremendous victory from their perspective in order to try and establish Vespasian as uh, as 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 a as a secure and effective uh, emperor, and sure enough, he was. He turned out to be established. He was he was from a Roman perspective uh, an industrious and and, uh, and 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 became a popular emperor. And his son Titus did eventually uh, follow him as the Roman emperor. Well, this area of Judea becomes uh, an area where essentially uh, anybody with uh, that was stuck in that area was motivated to do something to get out, and Vespasian ultimately did. 
Uh, and so um, the, I say all that not just to give a history lesson, but to just point out the fact that really throughout their history, from the time they had been sort of put under Roman oppression all the way until 70 AD, they were living under the constant threat of Roman procurators kind of extending their military muscle and showing them, you know, basically bullying the people down and pressing them down to demonstrate Rome's might, just sometimes out of spite, sometimes out of just trying to protect themselves and not be reported that they couldn't handle insurrections and uprisings in this insignificant little part of the world. Um, and so they were motivated ultimately to to show strength whenever an opportunity arose. And so that being said, the Jewish leadership, and in order to keep their independence, uh, did a lot to try and make sure that they would quash any uprisings that they could so that Rome wouldn't bring a heavy hand down upon them. And the Sadducees were in the front line of this kind of a thing, both playing the, uh, playing the Jewish bureaucrat, essentially, with the Roman leaders, trying to keep peace. And so as they now are dealing with Jesus, as the Sanhedrin is deciding what to do with Jesus, this is, helps to fill out the context in which they're working in. Um, these are not stupid people. These are not, as uh, you know, we, we sometimes mistakenly think of them as being like the keystone cops of the New Testament, where they just sort of bumble around saying things that Jesus puts them down, and then they go away just sort of shaking their heads. No, these are people that have a vested interest in protecting the nation of Israel, and they see Jesus not just as a threat to their own power, but ultimately is a threat to the nation's security against Rome. And so they're very motivated to figure out what to do here. And so they say, well, if we just let him continue doing these things, ultimately, uh, Rome is going to come and take away our place. Now, when they say our place, some of the translations uh, take that word there and they, they specifically assign it to the idea of the sanctuary or the temple. And that's not inaccurate per se. However, it is significant that uh, the terminology there, the place, actually finds its roots in the Old Testament. Uh, the place was uh, uh, a concept that was born out of a Hebrew term that was mahakom, which speaks of, uh, it speaks of the place that God has chosen. Now, it could be applied to the temple, and it seems to be applied to the temple or, or to the sanctuary in a couple of occasions in the Old Testament, but it's not limited to just that. It basically just speaks of that place that God deems as being holy, that place that God has chosen for some purpose, in particular in connection with his uh, holiness. And so uh, it could be on the one hand, they're talking about protecting the nation against uh, the, the Romans taking their power and authority away. They may be talking about the losing of the temple, this place where God has chosen uh, his presence to be or had up until the time when uh, it departed from the temple in Ezekiel's time. Or it may speak in the larger term uh, of uh, in connection with the nation where this, this, this holy people of God are dispersed. It could speak to a few different things, but it's not unfair to connect it with the idea of the temple and the sanctuary. Um, now, not only the, the, the sanctuary or the holy place or, uh, or, or the place, as, as they're referring to it, but also the nation. Now, as we alluded to already in 70 AD, their worst fears were fulfilled. Uh, uh, came to pass when Titus Vespasian again came with the Roman legions and ultimately destroyed the city and the temple. And the Jews were dispersed at that point. Josephus, a uh, great historian who was a Jewish general who ultimately sort of became friendly with Rome and became a, uh, his history is where we get a lot of our information from that period uh, as well as Suetonius and other writers of that time. But, but Josephus is a big hitter when it comes to understanding what was going on during that time. Um, and so we, we learn a lot about that from him and I'll commend that to your reading on your own but um, but I just want to connect it with biblical prophecy uh, when when Jesus told them that uh, that in Luke 21 in particular there's a good passage to see this explained by the Lord he describes how ultimately there's one who's going to come with the sword and 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 destroy them and everything and it's ultimately in connection with Luke 19, where Jesus weeps as he's about to enter the city because he had longed to gather them, Israel, his, his, uh, his, his uh, you know, like a mother gathers her hen, uh, her chicks, I should say, and but they would not. And they had also missed this particular day that he rose, rode into Jerusalem. And because they rejected him rather than receiving him on that day, ultimately their ruin came about in, in, in connection with that. 
Uh, and so it's a very heavy thing, but, um, but there's a direct connection here scripturally with what Jesus said then and what ultimately came just about 40 years down the road. So um, now what about Caiaphas here in verse 49? We pick it up again. And we're in verse 49. One of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Again, he had been the high priest in total from uh, it was from 18 to 36 A.D. So a couple of years after the crucifixion, a few years after the death and resurrection of Christ, he remained high priest. Uh, He said, you know nothing at all. Verse 50, you do not realize that it's more to your advantage to have one man die for the people than for the whole nation to perish. Uh, Now that is the end of what Caiaphas says. And that's important to recognize. Caiaphas uh, does not, John is not implying that Caiaphas understood fully what he was saying in the words that followed. But John is giving insight into the fact that Caiaphas, without even realizing it, actually had been prophesying uh, about what Jesus had come to do ultimately. Because you read the passage, and if you think Caiaphas said all this, why on earth would they kill him? Uh, you know, why? I mean, if he's going to draw people to himself and all this kind of a thing, did he understand the crucifixion and the resurrection? No. Caiaphas is simply saying this first part out of expediency because he's acknowledging a simple truth. Uh, um, you know, uh, I, forgive me for the pop culture reference, but I'm a Star Trek nerd. If any of you know Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, you know that Spock just lays out this expression that the needs of the men many outweigh the needs of the few. Okay, well, that's essentially what Caiaphas is saying here. The needs of the people and their survival are of greater importance than, than this one. And so we should, we should find a way to destroy him so that Rome will leave us alone. It's a very pragmatic statement. It's, there's no spirituality to it whatsoever. This is simply an expedient thing to do. If we want to protect ourselves, we need to find a way to end this guy so that we don't get in trouble with Rome and they find another excuse to pound us. And so this is a very practical thing that Caiaphas is doing and saying. However, John, 60 years later, is sharing his insights into the bigger picture of what Caiaphas was saying. And so John includes this sort of parenthetical statement here, uh, starting in verse 51. Now, he did not say this on his own, but because he was high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the Jewish nature and the nation. In other words, because he was high priest and his role was to speak on behalf of God to the people, but also on behalf of the people to God, his high priest. But when, he didn't even understand and know that he was actually, as high priest, he was actually sort of acting on behalf of God in his recommendation. That's interesting because, you know, when they're plotting to destroy Jesus in order to save the Jewish nation, uh, their plotting is evil. Their desire to destroy him is sinful. It's wrong. Matter of fact, it violates the sixth commandment, right? They're talking about killing someone in cold blood. That hypocrisy should not be missed. However, John is saying the bigger picture is that Caiaphas actually, without even realizing it, has actually prophesied uh, uh, on behalf of what's about to happen in that Jesus would in fact die for the nation and not only for the nation, but also to draw others to himself as well. And this is a a wonderful example of how God takes even uh, that which was intended for evil, but ultimately God intends it for good, as we might see uh, Joseph say to his brothers in Genesis 15. This principle uh, is is exampled here again as well. And that's important for us to remember as we think about what God does and how God does what God does and all these things. Everything that happens in the world, even when it's brought forth in the wickedest of all possible motivations, God can turn that into something that ultimately fulfills his purposes. Nothing happens outside of what God ultimately has ordained and will bring to pass. And those who are ultimately evil in their plan and their plottings are ultimately foiled in the fact that God uses that ultimately to bring about an ultimate good. And so here's a tremendous example of that right here. Um, And so verse 53 goes on to say, and so from that day, they plan together ultimately to kill him. And so they have been thinking about this for some time. They have discussed this previously, but now they have fully made a commitment to finding a way to to bring about the end 
of this rabbi, this carpenter's son, this uh, this Nazarene. They're ultimately going to seek to destroy him, and they're going to take great lengths to do so. And ultimately, they'll have their way when they uh, bring him before Pilate uh, and, and and cry for his crucifixion. Now. Because he's, Jesus ultimately, in doing what he has done, has brought them to the point where they now have to decide. They're going to make this choice now to do this. He withdraws himself from that area, and he goes to a place called Ephraim, which is a town about 20 miles north of Jerusalem. He's going to come back uh, shortly, ultimately, once the beginning of the Passion Week begins, or this final week leading up to the cross. But for now, he sort of leaves them to simmer, and he goes up north. Uh, to this town of Ephraim. And we see here during this period of time again that he continues to teach about various things. He'll go on and he'll, uh, he'll engage with the rich young ruler. He'll heal some lepers. He'll, uh, he'll teach on things like divorce and such. And he'll talk about all these things. He doesn't end his ministry prior to that Passion Week. But John doesn't record those things. The Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke do. But John here stops at this point, And the next time he, he brings us back, it's, it's at the beginning now as Jesus uh, of the Passion Week as Jesus is about to make his triumphal entry. In other words, one week from now, Jesus will make his way into Jerusalem where he will die. And so John sort of gives us pause here for a moment as he comes to the end of this and doesn't, doesn't speak about the other things. He wants to leave us right here and then bring us back to the point where it now leads right up to the cross. So what, what happens here? How does John end the passage? Well, again, thus no longer Jesus went around publicly among the Judeans, but instead went away to the, uh, from there to the region near the wilderness uh, to a town called Ephraim. And he stayed there with his disciples. And so his disciples are with him, and they're spending this time still together during this stretch leading up to the Passion Week. Uh, now, again, as, as we've discussed, as John has said here, the Jewish feast of Passover was near, and many people went up to Jerusalem from the rural areas before the Passover to cleanse themselves ritually. Uh, now, you, you often see it expressed, they go up to Jerusalem. Every direction is uphill to Jerusalem. And so if you're going to Jerusalem, you are going up to Jerusalem. But they're starting to gather now as the feast is right on the cusp. And, uh, and, and so they are gathering in the city. This is one of three major feasts that all able-bodied Jewish men had to attend. Uh, and the Passover is this pinnacle um, time that they would come and Jerusalem would be filled with people. The population would explode during this time and the streets would be crowded and there'd be markets and people buying and selling things and there'd be celebrating and worshiping uh, and not just people, but people with their families would be coming with their offerings and everything for the Passover time. It was a tremendous, supposed to be a tremendous time of celebration. Now, John doesn't record the second cleansing of the temple. He records the first uh, but the other Gospels record the second cleansing of the temple where Jesus cleans house because they've turned it into a marketplace rather than the house of prayer for all nations that God had intended it to be. And so, but that's the period we're coming up to now. We're right on the, the threshold of entering into this period. And so as they're all gathering there, people are asking, where's Jesus? They're expecting him to be here for the feast. Uh, people from not just Jerusalem, but people from all over. Remember, about three years of Jesus' ministry has gone by, so he is well known here uh, throughout the whole region. People are coming to Jerusalem because they assume he'll be there. Maybe they'll hear what he has to say. They'll see him perform miracles, some grand thing to go see Jesus. It was an event in some respects, not just for the Passover's sake, but also because maybe the Messiah himself is in our midst, and so it would be a grand time to go. And if you if you ever struggle to get to the Passover, over, you are going to be at this one because this is this the Messiah might be here in our midst. Rumors of such a thing had no doubt begun to permeate many of the Judean countryside areas, and now they were here. They wanted to, wanting to see him, and so they they're they're saying, "What do you think that he won't come? Of course he'll come. He's the Messiah, right? Of course he'll come. He's an able-bodied Jewish male. He'll be here. We'd have to see him." Sure enough, he would be here, for this would be his last. Uh, and ultimately, this Passover would be the Passover where the Lamb of God would ultimately be sacrificed and his blood shed so that mankind could be delivered from their sin, the penalty of their sin, the ultimate penalty of their sin. And so we're about to enter into that last week, uh, which we'll begin to look at the next time. Now, again, the chief priests and Pharisees have given orders that if anyone uh, knew where Jesus was, they should report it. 
so that they could arrest him. Um, they were gathering in the temple, and in just a very short time, Jesus would himself be right there in that area and uh, again would ultimately go to the cross. And so we will pick up there uh, later on um, and um, want to just kind of close in prayer and just put out there the idea that as we look at the life of Jesus, especially here as we come toward the end of it, uh, we want to be reminded of the depth of what Jesus accomplished, the meaning of what this story ultimately is all about, uh, what the person of Christ ultimately came to do. When God came into the world, walking among us through the Incarnation, his desire was to draw us into fellowship with himself, to end the enmity, to bring, uh, to bring a bridge to the gap, to ultimately remove us from the place of being lost and dead, to ultimately being alive and near. And so uh, that's why Jesus has a Last Supper. That's why this fellowship uh, meal that we're going to celebrate here in a moment is so vital, because it's all about drawing close to God through what Jesus accomplished. And when we take the bread, we take the cup. These things are symbols reminding us of what Jesus ultimately accomplished so that we don't forget. And so Jesus says, as often as you do this, do this remembrance of me. And this is what the body of Christ does. This is one of our, our, our uh, really one of two sacraments that Jesus installed, the other being baptism. But this is a sacred thing that we participate in together. And I hope that uh, you've taken a moment to go ahead and get some bread and some juice together. And we'll go ahead and partake here in just a moment. But I want to just kind of get our hearts and our minds in that place where we think about the crescendo of the story, the ultimate, uh, the, the culmination of the work that Jesus came to do. And we want to celebrate it and remember it because in that death and in that resurrection, we find our peace, we find our deliverance, we find our eternity secured in him, all by God's grace through faith. And with that, let me just share the gospel for any who may be watching or who may watch later. Um, the gospel or the good news is a very, very simple truth. It's profound in all of its implications and, and all that the scriptures have said in painting the picture leading up to the cross and the empty tomb. But, this, but the, 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 the good news itself is a very, very simple thing to understand. And it goes basically like this in its explanation. That you and I are something that's really offensive to say. It may bother you to hear this word, but hear me out. That you and I you and me, too, are sinners. We're people who by nature violate God's perfect standard. Uh, when we see the evil in the world around us, it's not just some general generic evil out there. Uh, it is evil that is perpetrated. It might be influenced by Satan, but it's perpetrated by people like you and me. Uh, I think it was G.K. Chesterton in a letter to the editor was responding to the question, what's wrong with the world? And his response was simple, simply two words, I am. Well, that's a really great way to put that. You know, um, when, 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 we, when we sin, it's not just mistakes. It's not just stumbling and falling. Um, it's our sin. Well, you know, the fact is that that sin separates us from God because nothing perfect, nothing less than perfect, I should say, can, can be in God's presence in heaven. Uh, he doesn't permit sin to exist in his presence. And so what do we do about this? You know, every one of us wants to go to heaven. We want to be at peace and, and just enjoy eternity with God. But our sin keeps us from that. So how do we deal with it? Well, our natural tendency is to think that if I just try harder to be good, that somehow I'll solve that problem. If I just do enough good things, I can sort of cover or outweigh the bad ones. We, we sometimes think of that scale outside of the pearly gates kind of a thing. And, and we think, well, you know, when they look at my good deeds, as long as they weigh down heavier than my bad deeds, I'm in. Well, the fact of the matter is, is that you don't get brownie points for doing good things. That's expected of us. We're supposed to do what's right. We're supposed to choose not to hurt people. We're supposed to choose not to lie. We're supposed to choose not to commit, uh, you know, to, to, to hate someone in our hearts, much less commit murder. To lust in someone in our hearts, much less commit adultery. We're supposed to do those things. We're supposed to do the right things. But we don't because it's just not in our nature to do it. Even Paul, the great apostle, wrestled with this truth within himself. Uh, matter of fact, if you still have your Bible handy, open up to Romans 7 for just a moment here. At the end of Romans 7, 
into the beginning of Romans chapter 8 is a profound truth from God. Look at what Paul, as he's wrestling with what I was just saying, the things that I want to do, he says, I don't find the strength to do. The things I don't want to do, those things I find myself doing. And and recognizing uh, just that horrible condition that he's in, he recognizes it. He ultimately, in verse 24 of Romans 7, cries out and says, Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? And then he says in verse 25, Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I find myself uh, that I serve the law of God with my mind, but in my flesh I still wrestle. I still serve the law of sin. But verse 1 of chapter 8 continues, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In other words, even though as a Christian, even though I've been following Jesus for almost 30 years now, I still, I fully understand what Paul is saying here. He finds he's wrestling within himself with the fact that there are still these sinful desires that exist. Well, if it depended on me to be good enough, I could never be good enough. And that's the problem. That's what causes Paul to cry out in anguish and really any sinner who finally comes to recognize their hopeless condition. Who can deliver me? Who can save me? Well, Paul points to Jesus, somebody who he hated and wanted to silence all of his followers. Now, is, is, is because he's been bought, bought and paid for by the blood of Christ, he's a believer. He recognizes the error of his ways. He understands he's incapable of saving himself. And there's such relief and joy in knowing that Jesus has come to take away not only his sins, but the sins of man. And so here you and I are. If you know the Lord, you can rest in the fact that there's no condemnation for you because you're in Christ Jesus. No longer can the devil point at you and say, hey, you're still a a filthy, rotten sinner, undeserving of heaven. You can look him in the eye, as it were, and say, yep, you're right, but I'm not going to heaven because I'm good enough. I never could be. But Jesus loved me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. He died for my sins that I might be right before God. And now I know that I have someone who stands before the Father and says, let him in. I paid his debt on the cross. Now, if you're not saved, if you're somebody who's never come to grips with your sin and come before the Lord and confess them and said, Lord, I am a sinner. I am a sinner. I need to be saved. I need to be redeemed. And you've never looked to the cross and seen that finished work accomplished in Jesus who died for them all, all of your sins, all of them, past, present, and future. And having paid for them all, he said, it is finished. Everybody knows those words from the cross, but do you know how deep and meaningful those words really are? It's like he's essentially the the same words can be translated and are translated elsewhere, both in scripture and literature. The idea that it is paid in full. There's no longer a debt for you to pay because Jesus paid it full. All that remains is for you to either receive that and to believe Or to slap his hand away and say, nope, I'm going to keep trying myself and reject the forgiveness and the grace that he offers you. If you do that, then there is no other end for you except separation from God in a place that Jesus said was ultimately created for the devil and his angels. But all of those who reject God's free gift of salvation through Christ have chosen that instead. Don't do that. Don't make that decision. Don't believe for one second that you can earn your way. If you could, then even again, as Paul would say, that Christ died needlessly, Galatians 2.21. Instead of thinking such a thing, instead, turn your heart over to him. Change your mind about that, this idea that you can earn it yourself. Change your mind about thinking you're a good enough person or that you ever can be. And change your mind to understanding that without Jesus, you're completely hopeless. But in Christ, you are hope-filled. You know that your sin is paid for and that heaven awaits when you take your last breath. Not only that, but Jesus will dwell with you, lead you, guide you in this life. He'll walk with you so that you're never alone. No matter how hard or difficult things get, no matter what kinds of things you go through, you don't go through it alone because he's with you both now and forever. And so I'm going to pray.
and I'm going to give an invitation to receive Jesus. And then we're going to go ahead and partake in, in what Jesus uh, shared with his disciples. We call it the Last Supper, that, uh, that, that, that meal he shared with them where he broke the bread and gave it to him and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. He shared the cup with them and said, this is the cup of the new covenant written in my blood. And it's for the remission of the sins of many. And you can partake in that as, as, a, as a born again, new believer in Jesus Christ with the rest of us. And we welcome you in. So let me pray now that you might receive Jesus and then we'll sing, we'll worship and partake. Father, we love you and thank you and praise you. You're so good to us to give us your grace, to forgive us for our sins and to take the punishment, the death uh, in, in your son, having taken our debt upon his shoulders, you have set us free. And we thank you for this, Father. And for all of us who know you, who've made that decision to, to, to say no to ourselves and our sin and instead to receive Jesus as our Lord, our Savior, the one who has redeemed us and has made us new, Father, we just rejoice in your love for us that is so rich and full and is expressed in the finished work of Christ. But Father, for those outside, those who've never come to that place, I pray for them right now, that Lord, by your Holy Spirit, you would convict their hearts, help them to realize they need Jesus, that there's no being good enough. There's no covering their own sin. It's a hopeless, fruitless pursuit. But Father, instead, you can save them. They can be born again, and you can give them the power to live differently. But short of that, it's hopeless. And so, Father, I pray for them right now, that they would recognize, having heard the gospel, their need for Jesus, and that they would receive him now and the forgiveness that he brings in his grace. So if that's you, pray with me now. Heavenly Father, I do confess to you that I am a sinner. I'm guilty of all of my sin. I'm not making excuses anymore. I'm not going to pretend that I can be good enough. I'm laying all of that down. And instead, I choose to put my trust in Jesus, who took my sins, every last wicked, stinking, rotten, filthy sin in my life. And as I think on them, I think of how absolutely terrible they actually are, but how good Jesus was to take them upon his shoulders as he died for them and paid for them at the cross. I don't deserve such love and I don't deserve such grace or mercy, but I thank you that you have accomplished this for me. Father, I just pray that as I receive Jesus as my Lord and my Savior, as I put my trust in the one who died for my sins and rose again the third day, that you would help me to walk in his ways. Teach me from your word what it means to be a follower of Jesus and help me to walk with you until I see you face to face. Thank you for forgiving me and setting me free. Thank you for an eternity and a hope that lies before me. And thank you that you've promised to never leave me alone here in this life. I bless you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to the family of God, child. I want to just invite you, by the way, if you prayed that prayer, let us know so we can get a Bible to you. We can begin to answer some questions and help you take those first steps walking with Jesus. And we'll also try to get you connected with a good, solid church. Hopefully, if you're in the area, you'll come visit us. But wherever you are, we'll try and set you up with a good church somewhere nearby that you can become part of that fellowship of believers and grow in your faith. But right now, we're going to go ahead and we're going to celebrate uh, this very thing we've been talking about as we partake of the bread and the cup. And I just want to go ahead and, and, and worship here as we do. So if you've got the bread and the, the juice ready, I want to invite you as I sing and, and play that you would just take your time and, and just consider the things we've been talking about, the grace of God in action and setting you free from your sins. And then partake as you will as we sing. Mm -hmm. 
Father, it's a good thing for us to remember. And Lord, as we take these last few moments to consider what Jesus finished for us, what he paid for for us, and the freedom he's now given us, the eternity that again lies before us. All we can do is just say thank you and bless you and praise you. And so, Father, as we sing out our time together, just flood our hearts with the knowledge, some sense of the understanding of the grace and mercy that you've poured out upon us, the incredible love that you've demonstrated in sending your Son, that if we believe in him, we'd not perish, but have everlasting life. Oh, God, how good you are. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing that second verse on the Mount of Crucifixion together. On the Mount of Crucifixion, fountains open deep and wide. Through the floodgates of God's mercy, float a vast and gracious tide. Grace and out, Lord, with a sense of joy and the fact that our relationship with you is not only set, but it's secure. And Lord, we can rest in your presence and never live in fear again, because now we belong to you and we're free in Christ. And we have grace, we have mercy, we have your love, we have your truth. We know that you're with us. Father, all of these things, Father, cause us to celebrate and rejoice. So thank you, Father. Go before us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. And uh, again, hopefully next week we'll be doing this from uh, our new location. So be praying about that, that nothing happens, nothing um, you know crops up that would preclude that from happening. And if so, then we'll send out information and we'll look forward to seeing you again, finally, yay, in person again. So God bless you. Thanks for joining us this morning. And uh, again, if you have any prayer requests, as we often say in our emails, let us know so we can pray for you as well. But in any case, have a great and blessed week. The Lord bless you.